Good afternoon. I'm George Latimer, Westchester County Executive. This is Monday, April 5th, and this is the first of our two updates on the Westchester coronavirus uh, outbreak here in Westchester County. We have now uh, continued uh, through a full 12 months and now a full 13 months in dealing with this pandemic. And as we have now for the last four months or so, we're reporting on the information twice a week, on Mondays and Thursdays, unless there's a week with a holiday, just to give you an idea of where we are with both the infection and also with the vaccinations. Uh, as we have done uh, in the past, we invite one of our local officials, mayor or supervisor, to join us to talk about what's happening in their municipality. Today, we're very honored to have Mayor Nikki Armacost of the village of Hastings on Hudson with us. She'll talk a little bit about uh, what's happening in that village. Uh, you know, Westchester County is uh, very diverse between communities as large as uh, the city of Yonkers and as small as the village of Buchanan. So we want you to get some, you know, backyard information. And for those who may be from Hastings, you'll see your mayor here, and we're happy to have her with us here today as we've had uh, different ones. And we also will uh, uh, announce an appointment that we're very proud of, a woman that we've known and appreciated for a long time as uh, the right hand of uh, our Congresswoman Nita Lowy, and uh, she's now going to be joining our county team. We're very happy about that, so we'll uh, reintroduce you to Pat Keegan a little while from now. First, we'll start with some numbers. The New York State Tracker uh, has not yet updated for today on Monday, so uh, perhaps within an hour or two, you might see numbers that are a little different from the ones that I'm reporting now. But uh, as it stands through Sunday, we have 5,944 active cases of coronavirus in Westchester County. That's on a pen pandemic to date basis of 121,507 total cases over the course of the time in the county and 115,563 of those cases have gone through the normal incubation period uh, that it would occur in an individual. So currently 5,944 cases. We went through a period of time of about seven weeks where we had a dramatic drop from the middle of January uh, until just a couple of weeks ago where we had a, a drop one week over the two prior weeks for the number of infections. Infections were dropping. Uh, the last two, three weeks, it's been a little bit different. We've been basically flat, slight increase on any given day, and it's it, we've really sort of hit a mark that hasn't dropped any further. Uh, I don't think any of us can interpret what that is without some professional advice. Uh, we do know that there are variants of the disease that are out there, uh, mutations that are more communicable, and that may be the reason why there's still a high number of cases that are testing positive. We know that the number of vaccinations are rising, so that means less people are being affected by it. And those two things may, may create this sort of static situation where there would be many more cases because of the mutations, but the vaccinations are suppressing that number. Absent the mutations, we would have thought that we would continue to see a further decrease of numbers that the more people are vaccinated, the less likely they will get those uh, infections. So we'll have to just monitor what we have over the next few uh, weeks to determine if there's any trends to watch. But in terms of active cases, the 5,944 is uh, slightly above what we were a week ago and uh, two weeks ago. But if you go back uh, to the, the, the similar period of time in March, March 7th, about the same number of active cases, both under the 6,000 number. And of course, if you go back to the middle of January, we were at 11,500, so that's really the dramatic drop. And now we start looking at numbers from where we were a year ago when we had the first initial in, uh, infection. Our hospitalization numbers have started to drop down again, which is good news. The most recent number we have is as of Saturday, 238 individuals have been hospitalized for COVID. The week before that, we were at 259, and uh, we were in that 250 category for a couple of weeks in a row. So the drop to 238 is a welcome drop. We were as high as uh, 588 in the middle of January and started to decrease. And the greatest amount of infection that we had was in the very beginning of the pandemic where we had 1,200 plus people who were hospitalized for COVID. The number of active cases represents the breadth of the infection. The amount of hospitalizations represents the depth of the infection, how sick people are who have COVID. And there are many people who contract COVID positive but don't experience the worst case scenario of it, but some do. Those that are hospitalized now, 238. And then of course, the, the worst possible outcome is a fatality. Uh, we currently have 2,214 people who have died from the coronavirus here in Westchester County. 24 individuals uh, died within the last week, and uh, we've been averaging uh, low single-digit deaths per night, one, five, six, two, three individuals over that period of time. I say it every single time because it has to be said every single time. A person's death is not a statistic. It is a human life that's lost, and there's a human element to all of that, and we would be uh, uh, completely 
a garish if we didn't, ex uh, didn't uh, remind ourselves of the fact that, that that is really what this whole pandemic is about. It's trying to respect and, and extend life for those people that uh, contract the disease and to mourn that life when it's lost. Uh, the number of uh, fatalities we do look at as a trend line and uh, we seem to be static. We're losing in about 20 people a week, which is uh, unfortunate. And those, those numbers are there. Now, they differ from community to community. You will see upticks and downticks. If you go to the dashboard, we are reporting uh, information regarding number of cases, active cases, uh, and total number of cases. That is the information that we receive from the state broken down by municipality. Mayor Almacost and all of her colleagues would like for us to provide more detailed information, which we would love to provide, but the state is the reporting entity for fatalities. Uh, when, the, when there is a fatality, it's reported to the state. When there is uh, some type of hospitalization, it's reported to the state. The state gives us county aggregate numbers back, but they do not break it down by municipality, so therefore I can't tell you what specifically is happening in Hastings or in Dobbs Ferry or in Ardsley or any place else in the county beyond the countywide numbers. But uh, the number of fatalities and the number of hospitalizations are still serious numbers. They are not as severe as they were during the worst of the pandemic, but the pandemic is still with us. The other set of statistics that we talk to now since uh, January is uh, the vaccination situation. We have vaccinated in the aggregate uh, from the four major locations of vaccinations, which would be the Westchester County Center, which is run by the state, the county's two clinics, one at the uh, community college on the Greenberg Mount Pleasant border, and one at the White Plains Health Clinic right here in downtown White Plains, and then also the Yonkers Army, which opened up uh, about a month ago. Those four locations together have issued 225,000 vaccinations. That's both first and second doses. And of course, the county center has been uh, just a massive uh, place for uh, vaccinations. They, they alone have done 161, almost 162,000 vaccinations, first and second doses. We're now reaching the point at which 30% of our population has been uh, fully vaccinated, either the one shot of J&J &J or the two shots of Moderna and Pfizer. Uh, and uh, we think that percentage now is just going to rise, primarily because the governor has now opened it up to, in essence, universal vaccination. We have, uh, as of last week, those 30 years of age and older eligible for vaccination, and as of this week, we open it now to those 16 years of age and older for vaccinations. So some of those provisions that we reported on in the past, what, um, you know, what type of occupational uh, responsibilities you had, whether you worked in restaurants or as a taxi uh, driver or you were a first responder, and that allowed you to have the vaccine rather than having to wait until you reach a certain age, all of that's behind us now. And the underlying health issues, the comorbidities, that's behind us now as well. If you want a vaccine, you should be able to get it started this week at 16 and above. I will point out one proviso that's important. The Pfizer uh, vaccine has been tested on people under the age of 18 and found to be acceptable for administration. So if you are, I doubt you're watching this, but if you are 16, 17 years of age, only the Pfizer uh, vaccine can be issued to you, not the Johnson & Johnson, not the Moderna. From 18 and above, all three of the vaccines are eligible to you. Now that creates an issue when you try to figure out where you're gonna get vaccinated. You have to know whether or not they're uh, authorizing a particular type of vaccine. And if you call the county health department, we will uh, uh, direct you in the proper direction. But that's only if you're 16 or 17 years old. If you're 18 or over, you can take any of the three vaccines. Many choose the Johnson & Johnson because it is a one-shot treatment, so convenience-wise, it's easier. Uh, the Pfizer and the Moderna uh, vaccines are out there as well. I have completed my two shots, both Moderna. I'm happy to report by some degree of dumb luck. I didn't have any particular after effects other than a sore arm. Uh, but whatever it is, everybody's got a different story. And I would just encourage you that uh, if, you, if you're waiting to hear some story, you'll find it, but that's not the, the long-term situation. Whatever short-term impacts come out of the vaccination process, once you're vaccinated, you are better protected against the disease. Nobody is perfectly protected from the disease, but we are better protected from the disease. And being better protected may mean that if you do get it, you'll get a less severe version of it and you won't be hospitalized. It may also mean that you avoid the worst of all cases, which is fatalities. But all of that is what we're dealing with now as we deal with those people who want to be vaccinated, and we know we've got some more ground to cover. We still don't have fully enough vaccine to issue a dose to everybody who wants it, so there is some late wait, some delay, but now as we're into the first full week of April, we see the light at the end of the tunnel, 
perhaps by the end of May, maybe a little sooner, maybe a little later than that, where everybody who wants a vaccine will be able to receive it. And when we reach that point, we don't know what the percentage will be. If we're 30% now, that might be 60% of Westchester residents. Hopefully it's 70%. And then we will reach a point, we'll worry about it a little closer as we get to it, where we're going to start efforts in concert with the federal government and the state government to try to make sure that those people who haven't yet taken a vaccine, and there's, there will be plentiful supply at that point in time, to encourage them to take the vaccine. Because if we have 40% uh, of, the, of the county or 40% of the country not taking the vaccine, that means the virus can still spread and there can still be uh, illness and, uh, and death that comes out of it. But right now, we're still trying to satisfy the demand that exists. We are making progress every day with vaccinations and along with the information about infections. It is, it is a you know, cautiously optimistic story, but uh, it's also an everyday story. We try to make through that every day. So before we go any further, I want to uh, invite uh, the mayor of the village of Hastings on Hudson to join us. Nikki Armacost was just recently reelected to a second term. Uh, she has served on the village board previously as a trustee under the prior administration. Uh, she has brought uh, a fresh energy to the village, and uh, she's got a very active board. They tackle a wide variety of issues. Beautiful community. If you have never gone through Hastings, uh, you owe it to yourself. They've got a great farmer's market on alternate Saturday mornings uh, right down, uh, right next to the train station. And uh, there's a lot of things that recommend uh, Hastings as one of the great river towns to live in. But uh, she has also been a good partner as we try to work through these problems at the county government. So I invite her to come up and tell us a little bit about the status of things at Hastings on Hudson. Mayor Nikki Armacost. Nikki, thank you. Thank you so much for having me, George. It's a pleasure to be here again. Special thanks to you and to everyone here at the county for all the support you've offered us during this incredibly challenging year. From the weekly calls to all of the uh, Westchester municipal officials ensuring that we were informed and well coordinated, to the data you provide on COVID cases, uh, at the village, county, and state level, to the PPE, to the encouragement that Norma Drummond provided on running a census drive during a pandemic, we were delighted to end up with an 80.1 percentage response rate, as well as all the Zoom visits and in-person uh, meetings with you and other members of your team. All of these actions were deeply appreciated and it speaks in volumes to the way the county continues to function as a true partner for its villages, towns, cities. Last time I came to speak, it was the day before the phase two opening for shops and restaurants, which we all felt was a ray of sunshine on an otherwise rather dismal spring. We had just learned the words parklets, streetlets, and streeteries, and in the coming months went on to implement a strategy designed to mitigate the effects of the pandemic on our local economy. First, we provided status updates to the community on how our businesses were faring. The pandemic certainly took its toll on our downtown and several much loved businesses shut down forever. But despite everything, we welcomed several new businesses to the village and remarkably, we have very low vacancy rates. While they certainly suffered, our businesses say they felt very much supported by the community, which fully embraced our mantra of buy local. Second, we liberalized some regulations. We were one of the only municipalities to allow our farmers market to operate from the very beginning of the pandemic, and it provided a lifeline to many residents who could shop safely and see neighbors while practicing social distancing. This summer, we plan to allow one of our restaurants to open a quaint hot dog stand, and we are adjusting the village code to enable this to happen. Right now, our peddler laws would prohibit this activity or at least require him to move every 10 minutes. Third, we repurposed public spaces. Last summer, we created those parklets using parts of parking lots and public streets, and several of our businesses created attractive outdoor dining spaces which were a huge hit with residents and visitors to the village. We will continue the parklets this year with no charge to the restaurants for the use of the space. We're also planning to create a sidewalk partlet, parklet, or as we are going to call it, a sparklet. Fourth, we created events that would bring the community downtown and promote sales for our merchants. As the weather got warmer last year, we offered some outdoor 
events, sidewalk sales, street closings to allow outdoor seating for restaurants, drive-in uh, drive movies, and outdoor music. We launched a digital gift card called Destination Hastings Downtown Dollars, and we did our best to get people out and into the downtown in a safe way. And finally, with the help of Shari Asher and, uh, from the county and our downtown advocate, Bob Prisament, we promoted business grants and loans. Uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, we shared information on grants and loans with our business owners as soon as they became available, including the Westchester First grants. We've also shared links for trainings, webinars on adapting businesses to the COVID environment. I want to give special thanks to Ellen and Steve and the rest of your team for helping us secure vaccines for our grocery workers, our seniors, our first responders, and frontline workers. We're all looking forward to tomorrow when everyone over the age of 16 will be eligible for the vaccine. What a long way we've come since I was last with you. While the pandemic curtailed many activities over the past year, the village of Hastings on Hudson had some remarkable achievements that I'd like to share. We were granted silver, smart, silver climate smart community status in September of last year, one of only seven municipalities in New York State. And we recently learned that we are currently the number one clean energy community in New York State. Some of the actions that helped us get to this point include adopting the New York Stretch Energy Code, CPACE financing, a low embodied carbon concrete policy, a shade structures policy, an environmentally preferable purchasing policy, a green fleet policy, and re-upping for community choice aggregation. We also produced a natural resources inventory and a climate vulnerability assessment and purchased two electric vehicles for the municipal fleet. Also, earlier this year, we dedicated 112 acres of open space as parkland which brings the total of dedicated parkland to 150 acres, representing about 84% of open space owned by the village. Our amazing volunteers also planted over 100 trees and initiated a pollinator pathways program. And later today, we are launching a mayor's challenge together with Sustainable Westchester and our Rivertown neighbors, Ardsley, Dobbs Ferry and Irvington, to see which of us can sign up the most residents for Grid Rewards, a program that gives residents cash back for reducing energy usage on predicted peak energy days in the summer. We also just submitted uh, our Police Reform and Reinvention Committee report to the state after vigorous debate and valuable input from our community. I want to close by saying that when I was last here, which was June 8th last year, I returned to Hastings only to hear that a brown bear had wandered into the village. So I'm hoping this visit will result in less drama when I get back home. Thanks again to you, George, and to your amazing team for all you've done for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was Mayor Nikki Armacost uh, from the village of Hastings on Hudson. Thank you for a very thorough report. And uh, we have a program with bears, so I think you should have no problem now. <clears throat> we use coronavirus money as we have in the past. But uh, we really appreciate that type of local um, uh, window on what's happening. There are 45 separate municipalities in Westchester County of all varying sizes and scope. And uh, each of them, and I say this across the party lines and what have you, each of them have very dedicated people who serve them. In fact, I had served in local government a long time ago. Uh, the level of government that's represented by villages, towns, and cities is a very up close and personal level of government. You hold public hearings and the people that testify are right in front of you. Uh, there's, uh, th there's a real sense for both well and sometimes for ill that people have immediate access to you. And so therefore it makes governing a little harder because you really have to address the issues uh, day to day up close and personal. And you've done that and thank you for your service. Tomorrow when you're sworn in, you have our great uh, wishes for a successful term with your colleagues on the Village Board. Thank you, Nikki Armacost from, from Hastings. <clears throat> so on with more of our report. Uh, we have mentioned already now that 16-year-olds will be eligible to get the, um, uh, the vaccines coming up. And the state has announced today that they are launching a statewide roll-up-your-sleeve campaign. 
encouraging New Yorkers who are 16 years of age and older and are eligible for the COVID-19 vaccine to start signing up tomorrow to schedule an appointment. The ad campaign is particularly targeted to New Yorkers from those in hardest hit neighborhoods to get vaccinated. And those ads are gonna start running uh, as soon as Wednesday. And uh, of course, they can start scheduling appointments on April 6th with the proviso that I've mentioned that uh, it has to be Pfizer uh, vaccinations if you are 16 uh, and 17 years old. The Moderna vaccination uh, is, the, is the primary uh, vaccine that we are administering through the Westchester County Health Department, and that is limited to those 18 years of age and older. So when we talk about vaccinations at our county clinics, the two that I mentioned, um, uh, and any of the satellite uh, pop-ups that we do as we have today in Portchester, we will be using Moderna, which means that those who are 16 and 17 will not be able to use it. Uh, so we don't intend to have frustration, but we have to follow the CDC guidelines and the vaccine has to be tested with an age cohort in order to be determined to be uh, acceptable for people of a younger age with a different you know, physicality than those of us who are over the age of 18. Uh, I was at the Porchester Satellite just within the last hour or two. Uh, that location is uh, today and tomorrow at the Porchester Senior Center, 222 Grace Church Street. We have some of our uh, key people who are there. Uh, Blanca Lopez, who's our Assistant Director of Operations, who's a Porchester resident, is out there doing volunteer work, along with uh, Chris Steers, who's a former village manager of Port Chester and um, key operation executive with us here in the administration now, and also city councilwoman uh, Martha Lopez Hanratty from New Rochelle, who is also there volunteering her time. It's really uh, you know, a tremendous effort. If you go to the Westchester County Center, you'll see a massive effort that can do 2,500 people a day. If you go to one of these satellite pop-ups, maybe it's only 200 or 300 people over the course of a day or two, but we're trying to do everything we can. If you are uh, interested in the uh, Port Chester site, uh, as we're speaking now, it, it runs until 5.30 tonight, 9.30 to 5 tomorrow. You can call the Senior Center in Port Chester at 939-4975. That's 939-4975. Or you can call the county at 995-2901. And uh, these are Moderna appointments that are being made, vaccines that are being distributed. So you will have to come back for your second dose appointment in four weeks and all of that uh, to, be, uh, to be together. Uh, we received some reports of unscrupulous individuals who are being um, uh, using their uh, opportunity to uh, give out vaccines to demand $20 for the vaccine from individuals, maybe those who are uninsured. Uh, let, me, let us be clear, there is no cost for COVID-19 vaccine. If you are being um, advised that there is a cost, then that person is operating in an illegal effort and need to be reported, and through the right state and county resources, we will track that individual down there. It should never be an out-of-pocket request for funds when getting a COVID vaccine. It doesn't matter if you're doing it through one of our centers, if it's being done at a local pharmacy, if it's being done in any context. No one may be denied the vaccine based on your uh, coverage, uh, insurance coverage, or your network status. Um, and you may not be charged uh, money if the vaccine is the sole medical service that is being provided. The vaccine itself is administered free to the individual. It's being paid for by the federal government in direct relationship with the various manufacturers. And uh, for individuals who do not require any additional medical services, when they visit a site, there is no charge for the COVID vaccine alone. There's some other information that uh, people have sometimes asked. They've asked for the vaccine recipient's private insurance company information, Medicare or Medicaid reimbursement. Sometimes uh, they've asked for uh, information that is not required, such as a social security number or other personal information, but no vaccine provider can seek any reimbursement from balanced billing through the recipient. So let's be clear about that. Any of these violations uh, can be reported. We have a number here for the Inspector General uh, for tips, but we encourage you to, to respond locally as well by calling uh, uh, us locally here at the county or the state, and we'll be happy to take care of that. Um, there's also some reports out there that some of the pharmacies are having difficulty delivering their second doses in a timely fashion. 
Uh, this is uncharted territory for all of us and for the pharmacies who are administering it. Uh, they have limited physical space and uh, sometimes limited staffing that can be allocated for this. If you can't resolve those issues at the pharmacy yourself, then give us a call at the County Health Department at 813-5000, 813-5000. This is if you've gotten the first dose and now you're waiting and you cannot seem to get the second dose from the same source that it was administered to you, whatever that source may be. Primarily, we assume it'll be one of the local sources. Uh, we will work to make sure that you get that second dose. 813-5000, that is the County Health Department. Um, many schools are back in, uh, uh, in session. Uh, tomorrow. Uh, some may be back today, some have not left session, but uh, quite a few of them that uh, went to hybrid or remote learning are coming back in now for the rest of April, May, and June, try to recapture as much of the uh, school year as is possible. We're working with schools to monitor the situation. Uh, the county responsibility is not a direct responsibility to authorize uh, what happens at a school district. The state has established that the school district has the authority to make the decisions about opening and closing schools uh, for logistics purposes. Our job is to make sure that people in the school world are vaccinated, which we can do, to make sure that we have some assistance for the school districts in terms of getting testing materials, PPE, and then also to provide assistance in sanitization and uh, structuring for social distancing, what happens at those different areas. And we are prepared to do those things with districts. Every Monday morning, we have a, um, uh, a conference call, 8.30 in the morning, with a variety of school superintendents. There are 44 school districts in Westchester. We generally get a fair number of them on the call, and the rest receive a report from their organizational group. And uh, we talk through some of these issues. Uh, there's a host of issues, large and small, uh, but we try to work through all of them. We want students to be back in classroom. We know that is the place where they get the best possible learning. We want them to be back safely. We want the other people who work in the school building, whether they be teachers or other administrative personnel, to also be in a safe environment. And we want to work with those school districts to make that happen. Uh, and that is something we're striving for. But as kids go back to school, parents, you know, have to be on, uh, on notice to uh, work with their children and understand what's happening. And certainly, if there are any outbreaks, uh, working with the health department, the school districts will take the appropriate action to try to make sure that this doesn't turn into a, 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 reignition, a reignition of the, uh, of the pandemic, which we're all very concerned about. We're holding a town hall session uh, to uh, uh, deal with this issue of uh, those individuals uh, who are uh, suffering from some disability and how they handle the COVID issues. One of our uh, town hall programs that we've had, it's uh, scheduled to be held on April 15th, uh, which is a Thursday from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. I will once again have with me our County Health Commissioner, Dr. Shalita Amler, our County Mental Health Commissioner, Michael Orth, and the Office for People with Disabilities Director, Evan Latanier. Uh, they will be with me to answer questions, and you can write in questions through email to communications at westchestergov.com. The always present uh, Director of Communications, Catherine Chaffee, will be there to uh, take the questions and forward it to various members of the panel and try to get certain questions answered. With a one-hour format, clearly we're not going to be able to answer every question, and we're not going to necessarily be able to answer questions that are very individually driven or unique but uh, we'll do our best uh, to do what we can across the board. That's coming up on the 15th, excuse me. We have uh, also some very good news from the New York Knicks. The New York Knicks, which are playing pretty good basketball these days, uh, have uh, also worked with us in a uh, public service announcement, some members of the Knicks executive team, their president, and some senior management, encouraging people to get the COVID-19 vaccine. This was recorded right after they received their own vaccinations at the Westchester Community College, and some of those individuals spoke about why they got the vaccine and their hope for others to sign up. All who uh, did so were age eligible at the time of receiving the vaccination, and we think uh, it's one more effort to try to uh, put out there the information that many of us have been vaccinated, uh, that vaccination is safe and it is effective. Uh, let's take a look at what that effort looks like. I'm very thankful to be here, to be quite honest. So I'm just, uh, I've been kind of waiting for, for this day. Scott Perry, General Manager of the New York Knicks. I've been looking forward to getting the vaccination. Hi, I'm Leon Rose, President of the New York Knicks. It's an important step for, for all of us. Hi, my name is Tom Thibodeau. I'm the head coach of the New York Knicks. 
I'm just going to roll up your sleeve. It's a, a moment where hopefully we can all move forward. It will save lives. You're not only helping yourself, but you're helping all of those people that are around you. Vaccination is going to be the way that we defeat this virus. Just a pinch. Pretty smooth. I didn't even feel it. Yeah. I'm good. All right. And I think it's an important step for all of us to take to get all of our lives back to normal. The more of us that are vaccinated, the better chance that we have of defeating this virus together, because it's going to take all of us together. I really look forward to seeing everybody back in the garden soon. This PSA is part of an ongoing campaign to encourage people to uh, use the vaccine across the county. And of course, the next training facility is located here in Westchester County in Greenberg. So uh, we appreciate uh, the management standing up for this opportunity. And now that people under the age of 30 can uh, get the vaccine, then the, then the players themselves will soon be eligible. And uh, we look forward to their continued good play. We're hoping for the playoffs this year. It's been a while and it'd be nice to have them back in the playoffs. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, or reintroduce to many of you Patricia Keegan, Pat Keegan, as she's known. She's joined the Westchester County Department of Social Services as an assistant to our new commissioner, Leonard Towns, whom you met here uh, within the last month. She's going to work on internal and external communications. Pat, we all know in government, served for more than 26 years as district director to Congresswoman Nita Lowy. She supervised constituent services and community outreach in district offices both in Westchester and Rockland County. And, and if you go back uh, during other days, Nita at various times in her career represented parts of the Bronx and other jurisdictions as well. Pat's been there for uh, the vast majority of this as a right hand to Congresswoman Lowy. Um, she has been Director of Communications for the New York State Department of Education, and she was a reporter and editor for the Cadet Westchester Newspapers, the, uh, the parent company that now is, uh, we know of as the Journal News or LOHUD. Uh, she's a longtime Westchester County resident. She holds a degree from the College of New Rochelle, and uh, she also has a master's degree in journalism from the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. She brings a tremendous wealth to us here in the county government. And I can't tell you how many times, as a county legislator and assemblyman, a state senator, I call Pat's office for Nita Lowy, 428-1707. It's burned into my brain. We have a uh, problem on an immigration issue. We have a, a young person who wants to go to one of the service academies. Uh, we have an issue that involves uh, federal uh, benefit of Social Security and so forth. We turned to Pat, and Pat was right there, always ready to help us out. So it is a great uh, advantage that we now have a part of our county administration family. Pat Keegan, please come up and say hello. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to sincerely thank County Executive George Latimer for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Uh, as George said, I have worked for Congresswoman Lowy for uh, more than 26 years and lived in Westchester for, don't tell anyone, but almost 50 years lived and worked here. Um, it's a wonderful county. Um, I want to continue to work with so many of the people that I love and respect in this county. Um, so that's why I'm particularly grateful to the county executive. As our Hastings mayor said, uh, County Executive Latimer, particularly during this pandemic, has um, shown tremendous leadership in bringing together all layers or levels of government. We all have to be partners uh, from the local elected officials through county, state, and federal. And if we don't have that sense of communication and transparency and all working um, to help represent um, people in these very um, trying times. So I'm, I'm looking very much uh, forward to it. I've had great relationships so far with so many great people who do work in county government. I'm getting to know uh, Commissioner Towns and DSS, all the tremendously dedicated people who work for the Department of Social Services. It's amazing all the great programs and services that DSS has to offer. Um, I view my role and certainly hope to reach out to many of the nonprofits, the faith-based communities, and all our other partners in um, expanding the access and the public awareness of all that DSS has to offer people. So I am thrilled for the opportunity, County Executive Latimer. Thank you, and I look forward to um, working with Commissioner Towns and the other uh, wonderful staff in DSS to get the word out. So thank you. 
again, we're very happy to have uh, Pat come on board. And uh, we've made an effort. We know that these, um, uh, these updates are really meant to talk about the COVID uh, uh, virus infection and now the, uh, the efforts to solve it. But I also use this opportunity to introduce you to different members of the team that we're adding. As I mentioned, uh, Leonard Towns, our new DSS commissioner, we introduced you here. Andre Early, who's a deputy commissioner in uh, the Department of Parks, Recreation, and Conservation. Michael Gerald, and uh, now deputy commissioner in com uh, of uh, Corrections Department, and Nori Padilla, who's the first deputy commissioner in that department. Lisa Reyes, who's been part of our family now for the last couple of months. And uh, each of these individuals are talented individuals. And I'm very fortunate that I have the opportunity now in this particular position, because I've worked with all of these people in other capacities, and I saw their talent and their ability. And I knew that someday, if you ever have to try to get the best possible people together, that's what you seek. Because uh, it, it, is, it is an absolute fallacy to think that any one person uh, runs a government. Uh, you may be the chief executive officer, as I am, of this government at this moment in time. But your success or failure really depends on having quality people around you, people who understand, know things, have relationships and connections, and can help steer public policy in the right direction. Some of my colleagues on the Board of Legislators are now part of this administration. Jim Masano, Mike Kaplowitz, in an acting capacity, Richard Wishney. These are people I've worked with, talented people, and I'm very fortunate that they're with me. Some individuals, a former judge like um, Bill Giacomo, who's now working with us in our law department. So um, I, I think it's important to understand that it's talent that drives the train here. And uh, that talent that Pat has shown and others have shown now are put to benefit for the residents of Westchester County. I'm very grateful that she's agreed to come on board with us and uh, we look forward to her contributions. That'll be significant. Um, let me just close out uh, our prepared comments by mentioning that April is recognized nationally as National Fair Housing Month. We have a video series to discuss the importance of fair and affordable housing in Westchester County, which has been a controversial issue in this county over the years. Uh, this month has been so uh, designated to celebrate the passage of the Fair Housing Act of 1968, a national law that prohibits discrimination in the sale, rental, or financing of housing based on religion, race, or gender. The video series that we have, you'll see one clip in a second, is designed to demystify some of these issues that surrounds affordable housing and to try to explain the importance of, of having fair housing here in Westchester County. This video series is a product of the county's housing needs assessment, which we did in 2019, uh, long overdue to really make an assessment of how far we are. Uh, we've allocated uh, money in our county budget each year for land acquisition, for infrastructure improvements, uh, we have had uh, a significant amount of affordable housing that the county's been involved in in some way, shape, or form. We may have been involved in a direct grant. We may have been involved in um, uh, putting uh, some money aside finance through the IDA, Industrial Development Agency. But in all of these different things, uh, whether it's land use or infrastructure, it takes extra effort to provide housing at below market rate. And we need people in this county to be able to live here who can't afford market rate housing but their talents are, are welcomed and necessary, the nurses and the teachers and the firefighters. So uh, with that, we'll uh, give you an idea of what the series is like with this following video. Whatever home is, it should be a place of uh, refuge and, and respite. To have a, a livable environment for both adults and children is an essential thing in life. That's why April is Fair Housing Month, so that there's a fair opportunity for housing for people. That it doesn't matter what demographic you may be in, old, young, uh, white, black, uh, any ethnic group, uh, that you have that opportunity and housing is made open and fair. That's why we celebrate that this month and we highlight it with this series of interviews that we have. You need to have all of that range of people and you need to have them here in this county. You need to have your emergency workers at the ready. You can't have them living 20, 30, 40, 50 miles away from us when they're needed in an emergency. So I think we have an obligation to make sure that housing is available, that it is, uh, it is fair opportunity for accessibility for everybody, and that also we understand that the affordability factor is a necessity for wide groups of people. The last two budget years we put in in capital, $10 million for new land acquisition so we can buy the piece of land upon which, or help buy the piece of land upon which housing is going to be built. An additional $10 million in each budget, capital expenditure, for infrastructure improvement. I was involved as a state legislator with a company called Laz Development. We helped them finalize a housing project in Rye City, my home community now 
41 units of senior housing, and they came back with a project in Port Chester for another 36 units of housing, which has come to fruition, it's now open. And I've gone in there with PPE, along with our county legislator Nancy Barr for that area, to the various, and you see the people, the seniors who are there, of all different backgrounds and how much they appreciate it. This is about a critical need that people have. You realize you're helping people when you can get them into a decent housing setting in which they can afford it. And that, to me, is worth it. That's why it's important to me. If you're interested in pursuing a uh, fair and affordable rental or homeowner opportunity here in Westchester County, you can visit the county's HomeSeeker website. HomeSeeker identifies the affordable housing units that are available based on location, and it notifies those who qualify when a new home becomes available. For more information, contact the Westchester County Department of Planning at homeseeker at westchestergov.com. We appreciate that. Uh, before we go to questions, I uh, just want to highlight that uh, uh, tonight and the next couple of days represents periods in which new elected village officials will be sworn into office. Uh, tonight, the village of Tuckahoe, uh, new mayor Omira Andino will take the oath of office along with uh, new trustee Daryl Taylor and re-elected trustee Renee Howell. We wish them great success and good luck. Uh, the same is true in Pleasantville, where uh, there are members of the board that were recently elected that will be sworn in tonight. Uh, in Elmsford as well, the Elmsford Village election uh, now will bring uh, those who have been re-elected there. And then tomorrow night we'll have uh, the new mayor of Portchester sworn in also uh, in Hastings, as I mentioned previously. So this is one level of government, but it's an important level of government, and uh, we congratulate those that uh, were successful, and we look forward to working them in a partnership. So with that, I'm going to turn to uh, Catherine Chaffee, a director of communications, who has a few questions for us. Catherine. So the first question comes from Samantha Crawford from News 12 Westchester. She asks, to your knowledge, will there be an increased number of, of vaccination appointments available for people because of the increased number of doses coming to New York and universal eligibility? Uh, Samantha Crawford from News 12 had that question. Yes, the expectation is the more doses we have, the more appointments we have. I think you're going to see that, uh, you know, what we suffered through in the beginning of this process in January or February is now going to be less and less the reality and much more easy for people to get appointments. Now, by widening it, widening it to everybody, basically in the society, there will be a little crush right at the front end. But uh, over the course of time, we expect that the additional doses means uh, more available appointments. And there's different ways you can access the appointments. We remind you that you can go on the state website. That website will connect you to opportunities at the county center and at the Yonkers Armory. Uh, and the same would be true uh, for what we're doing in Westchester County government. Your local pharmacy will get allocations. We post the pharmacies and the allocations each week. And then uh, through different organizations, we have the satellite ones pop-ups, as they're nicknamed, uh, and those satellite uh, sessions are usually linking a medical provider with a, uh, a local organization in a, uh, in a remote location somewhere out in the county. So there's a number of different places to get the vaccine. If you, uh, you know, just look around, go on our website, you'll get the information you need. We expect Samantha to have more appointments uh, that will satisfy the demand. Okay. Next question also from Samantha. Some reports say more young children are getting infected with the COVID variants. What's your health department seeing and are you concerned? Additionally, how do we stop this as more schools are bringing students back full time? Well, I, I don't think we're at a point yet where we can draw a conclusion that that is the case. And most of the schools are just coming back in now that have not been out. So I think we, we owe it to ourselves to see whether or not, you know, what we hear is really the reality of it. There's a great tendency uh, in something like this, because it's a serious pandemic, to listen to whatever is the worst case scenario and then project it as the norm. And, and I am as guilty of this, Samantha, as anybody was. Before I got my second shot on Friday, I read everything about how the second shot will make you sick and you will be under the weather and so forth. It didn't happen to occur to me for whatever reason, but I had the same concerns. And I think that's reflected in, you know, in the question, which is, do we think that there's going to be now, with children going back to school, a tremendous outbirth in the number of, of infections? There is testing going 
going on at all schools on an ongoing basis. That is part of the protocol that, that we have, and uh, it's not limited to just those playing athletics. It's all some percentage of all children back at school. If we see that there is a spike in a particular school building or in a school district or, or everywhere universally so, then we're going to take action to, to step back away from it. But we've gone a long period of time now without children in classroom settings, and I think most school districts are prepared now to move forward on that, take the proper health uh, requirements, masks, sanitation, social distancing to the greatest extent possible. And, and I will tell you, I've heard at various other times, you know, just before we opened golf courses a year ago, just before we did the Bicycle Sunday, all sorts of uh, worst case scenarios that were being uh, feared. And, and I don't necessarily know they came from a bad motivation, but there was the sense of what if this, what if that. I'm not prepared to assume that we're going to have the worst possible scenario happening in the schools. I, I think the schools will open safely. However, if I'm wrong, and the critics are right, then we'll certainly take action to go in the other direction. But for right now, after this length of time, I think we go forward with school openings and we manage it as well as we can. We just had the same argument, if you remember, two months ago on high school high-risk sports. And you know there were folks who said you should open immediately and some have said the exact opposite. We opened, we opened carefully and slowly, and we haven't had a major increase in infections. So I think if we do it the right way, it'll work. Okay, the next question is from Martin Wilbur from The Examiner, he asks, how widespread is this unscrupulous behavior regarding people being charged for the vaccines around the county? Is it mainly at local pharmacies or other sites? Well, uh, Martin Wilbur from The Examiner uh, news publication, uh, weekly newspapers. Uh, Martin, the, um, the, the cases that we have heard began with a particular pharmacy in a particular location in northern Westchester. We'll talk offline uh, on background. Uh, we are trying to research whether those claims are credible. We think they are credible, but we have to make sure we research them. And we're going through the state for follow-up. Where they involve a chain pharmacy, uh, then the uh, senior executives of the chain are informed, and they can take internal action against uh, the individuals who manage a particular branch if they're guilty of it. We have gotten more than one story from certain different locations that, uh, that individuals have been uh, requested to pay in order to get their vaccine or other complications, other information that was requested that are not required. So we're going to investigate it, but we're going to do it quickly. And if there's any behavior that's, uh, that's inappropriate, we're going to shut it down. Uh, and I would just say generally to anybody watching this report, anybody who reads your newspaper, uh, if they have any questions, we're inviting them to uh, call us and let us know. I assume we use the health department number, 813-5000 and we will work with the state to go after uh, any individuals. We, we need to send a message very clearly. You don't get to take this pandemic and try to make money off of it or to try to make some other point that you want to make. We're here to try to make people feel as comfortable as they can going through what is an uncomfortable situation, which is getting vaccinated. Uh, it's not something we do except that we have to do it. And uh, we don't want any complications along those lines. And we intend to pursue those uh, entities that may not be doing the right thing. And the next question, uh, last question as well, is from David Proper from Low HUD. He asks if this situation um, has resulted in any fines or other punishment for, uh, for these offenders. Uh, David Proper from the journal News, Low HUD, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, we've not reached the point yet at which fines or action would be taken. If it would be taken, it would be at the state level. It's the state that has the authority. Uh, uh, pharmacies, uh, to use one example, the same would be true of hospitals and other entities report to the state. They're regulated by the state, and the state would have the uh, uh, executive authority to come down on them. But uh, that process is, is undergoing right now. We've gotten some reports over the last uh, half a week or so. And um, we want to make sure, obviously, before there's any action uh, that's taken, that we're absolutely in, uh, you know, uh, taking correct action that we have verified reports. But they seem to be significant enough so that if the investigation bears them out, the action will be taken and uh, we'll see just how these, uh, and any entities that have been, uh, you know, playing games, how they'll be dealt with. But the intent is to make sure that uh, they perform properly. The state has the ability to withhold vaccines from any entity, from the county, from a pharmacy, individual, from a chain of pharmacies. That is a tremendous power. And if the county decide, uh, the state decides, forgive me, the state decides that a particular pharmacy or branch of a pharmacy has not been uh, performing properly, that that vaccine dosage can be yanked from them and they can be subject to other penalties. Uh, it would be very unfortunate for those involved in such a scam. So uh, the best advice is if you're doing something out there wrong and you know it, stop doing it right away. 
Any other questions? No, very good. Well, okay, we thank you for watching. We're very appreciative again for Mayor Armacost and for Pat Keegan, who are here. And I also want to thank our team, uh, Dave and Phil, who provide such tremendous technical assistance for us. Uh, the communications staff, not just Catherine herself, but the folks who work with her. Uh, we have with us uh, Lisa Reyes and, and at other times Carolyn Fortino, Joe Scamato, Chelsea Pagano, and uh, we benefit greatly from that communication. If there are any questions that come uh, as soon as this is over, feel free to reach out to Catherine at 995-2932. We'll try to answer any of these questions. Uh, as quickly and as honestly as we can. We'll be back again on Thursday at 2 o'clock for the second uh, update of the week. Uh, we always hope that the numbers will uh, be good, a little better then than they are today, and we'll continue in the right direction. I'm George Latimer, Westchester County Executive. Thank you for watching. Have a good day and be safe.